after three. One, two, three. This, this is, is the Front Row Club. Club. At Leicester Street. Three. 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 Welcome to William really Monthly. Should we do it again? This, this is, is the Front, front Row Club. Club. Oh, God. <laughs> This, this is, is the Front Row Club, Club at Leicester 2023. 2023. Welcome, Welcome to Marillion Monthly! Monthly. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to this month's Marillion Monthly where I will be interviewing the one and only Ian Mosley. Good morning. Coming up, uh, there's some interviews with the uh, Front Row Club, well, members of the Front Row Club, just to find out why they queue at six o'clock in the morning to just, you know, all day to see us play and get at the front of the stage. And we're just trying to get to the bottom of it, really. Tim will be talking to Tony Firminger, the chap behind all the surprise, the band stuff that happens every year at Leicester. And we'll be finding out what he did this year. Oh, another thing, I'll be revealing the uh, winner of last month's competition. I should probably preface today's interview by saying that not only is Ian the drummer of Marillion, he is also my husband of the last 18 years. <laughs> so this interview may be different to the previous Marillion monthlies, but we will try our best. Hmm. Anyway, hello Ian, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Should we have got somebody else to interview you? Yes. Yes. Should we try hard? <laughs> yeah, go on then. No, seriously. Yeah. So, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> so the Marillion weekends, we've done five. Wow. And we've got one left. How have they been going for you? Um, really, really good. We did Port Zealand first, didn't we? Yes. And, um, you know, with all the bells and whistles and and uh, I wasn't sure about how the the rest were going to go but um, I think Italy was probably one, my favourite. So far we yeah. still have Berlin left. Yeah still got Berlin. Uh, the last one the last one was brilliant Leicester and of course we had um, Lewis on percussion with us and I just uh, love having him, having him next to me. I know you stage. do. What what is it about having Lewis on stage that makes everything different for you? Well, apart from it, him being a, just a really lovely bloke, it's great having him there next to me. He's got a full understanding of what I have to go through at a gig with <laughs> click tracks and everybody playing in time and listening to me. And, and what Lewis is brilliant at is, for me, I can be playing... If I'm just playing a straightforward rhythm, Lewis can add to it and just smooth it out. And if it's feeling a little bit lumpy to me, or Lewis will just add a, a percussion part that will smooth it out and just make it swing. Things like uh, Sierra Leone, that's a very straightforward track from the drum point of view, but what Lewis adds to that is uh, just a, little, a few shakers and whatnot, and it just smooths out the rhythm and, and he makes me sound good. <laughs> <laughs> you are good. Yeah, but he does, he, he helps a lot. And, you know, when the percussionist locks into the, the drummer and say, well, I lock into him, it's, um, it just smooths things out. And the rest of the band enjoy having Lewis on stage as well, you can tell. I, th I think they do, because he's a real character. And um, and it also, at the same time, it makes the rest of the band, I think, it makes the rest of the band focus a bit more. Because they think, wait a minute, we've got a professional on stage with us. <laughs> <laughs> In every interview I've done, I think all of you have always said the word, all, you know, like when we've had the, the girls playing or we've got professionals on stage. Proper Do you not yeah. see yourselves as professionals or proper musicians? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, when the girls at, at Port Zealand, I mean, they hadn't played with us for a long time. And after the show, I, I said to um, Nicole, I said, that was really impressive. You got, you know, I didn't hear any cock-ups. And she said, what? 
I said, I'm really sorry, I apologise, you're professional, aren't you? <laughs> you're professionals, I forgot. So, so the last few years you, you've had the orchestra, you've had Lewis join, is there any other kind of musicians that you'd like to perform with on stage? I mean, anything orchestral I always enjoy, so yeah, more, more orchestral musicians I think would be good. It'd be great at some point to get get to choir noir. Quiet, yeah, get get them on stage with us. Um, I don't know the logistics of it all are probably a nightmare, but um, financially it's probably a nightmare as well. But but all that is half the fun. Is it? Yes. <laughs> but that, yeah, that full choir that would be that would be great actually. Do you think you'd like to do what? Like what Steve Hackett's just done with the 90-piece orchestra or whatever, or do you think that would just send you all over the edge? <laughs> it would probably send Phil over the edge, our, our sound man, Phil Brown. But yeah, I'll, I'll be up for it. But it would take a lot of rehearsing, I think. I think it would take a lot of rehearsing. And it would also too. take a lot of arranging, but I, I should imagine if that happened, it would be um, Mike Hunter, our producer, would get stuck into string arrangements and whatnot so do you think mike could know how to do a full orchestra yes yeah wow yeah yeah he's 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 far too clever really and so humble about it and modest but he's he's gifted so with the marillion weekends and we've got berlin coming up this is actually going out on your birthday, by the way. This this episode's going out on June the 16th. So, happy birthday. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. He's, he's a bit miserable because it's a big birthday and he's not happy about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was always the youngest in every band I was in until I joined Marillion. And suddenly I'm the old git. You know, so. They're all catching up, though. Yeah, serves them right. Serves them right. So, with <laughs> have you had of all the, of all the Marillion weekends, which song have you enjoyed the most? I've really enjoyed uh, Crow and the Nightingale a lot, especially when when I can hear the guitar solo properly, and it all locks together. <laughs> So, Care, yeah, I think that's just such a great arrangement, a great song, great lyric, and it, it, uh, it's really powerful. The angels in the world are not in the walls of churches. The angels in the world are not rendered in bronze or stone. No, these are the second lot of gigs, I think, with your touring kit from the British Drum Company. Mm. How are you getting on with it? Really well. Very, very pleased with it. It's a great sounding kit. Phil assures me. <laughs> oh, it, it, it definitely is. I know you think I'm just saying this because A, I'm your manager and B, I'm your wife. But <laughs> I, can, I can hear the difference. I can hear your drum kit 
I can't put it into words, but it sounds beautiful. And and the fans comment on that as well. It's, that's quite strange because it shouldn't really make that much of a difference. It must be down to what Phil's doing out front because the basic kit is, you know, over the years I've had Yamaha kits and Tama kits, but um, and they're great drums. But the since I've changed to the British Drum Company, um, the, the kit seems to be more prominent in the mix, I think. Uh, well, people are definitely commenting on it more than, than you know, I've ever seen. Hmm. One thing I did on the last tour was, um, I can't remember which gig it was, but I broke the bottom snare head. I used a Ludwig um, Black Beauty snare drum. I've used that for my whole career. And the bottom head broke. Oh, during the gig? During the gig, yeah. Yes, that was fun. So it was quite... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said that you could hear me shouting at Marcus. Because... I could hear you shouting. Well, yes. I've, I've got my headphones on, so I don't really hear the audience or the ambient noise going on. And it broke, and so I, I took it off. And I expected Marcus to get my spare snare drum and just put it on the stand. And after a minute, I was playing, I was using my piccolo snare, which is on the left, as a substitute, because I didn't have a, my main snare drum there. So I'm playing it, and I thought, oh, what's happened? And I looked down, and, and Marcus was actually changing the drum head, which would take about, you know, half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Marcus, what the f are you doing? You know, just get me another drum. And apparently, yeah, everyone heard that across the stage. Cause yeah, just... oh, well, I was at the side of the stage by the monitor desk, and I just heard you yelling with some expletives that we can't use because we don't want to rate this an 18 video. <laughs> you know what, so if someone's wearing headphones and you speak to them, they go, what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Change me yeah. drum kit, Marcus! <laughs> expletive, expletive, expletive. But since that happened, um, I used a British drum company snare drum, a wood shell. I can't remember what it's called. I think it might be called a Merlin, the model number. It's a wood shell, whereas the Black Beauty is... It, is you nodded off yet? Yeah. <laughs> um, is a metal shell. So I tried the wood shell, and I really loved it. And I've been using it ever since for the last what, six or seven gigs. And I'm still using it now. So, so there might be a Ludwig Black Beauty for sale at some point. Well, the um, just talking of... <laughs> <laughs> nerdy stuff a lot of of the fans have asked if it, they really enjoyed during the couch convention um during lockdowns you 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 did a couple of drum clinics online and and you showed people what it sounded like to listen to your click tracks mm. do you think um in the future you'd be prepared to do uh, sort of more nerdy drum <laughs> filming stuff with tim so that the fans could get, you know, the, the, the fans, we seem to have a lot of fans who play the drums and I'm sure that they would all be interested in the really nerdy mm. stuff that you and Gavin Harrison talk about for hours. Wingnuts and stuff. Yeah. Tell, tell, everyone, <laughs> tell everyone about your lunch with Gavin Harrison. What? what? That turned into an all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I popped over to Gavin's. Um, and spent the day day with him, and um, yeah, what a good bloke. But he said to me, how much practice do I still do? I said, I don't really practice, Gavin. He said, what? And I said, well, I do practice, you know, I, I practice rudiments to keep the chops up to speed and whatnot. But but Gavin, um, I sat behind his kit. He's got a, a, a studio at home, great studio, and his kit's there. So I sat behind his kit, and I, I was playing... He had a little play, and his bass drum pedal, was, which is the same pedal that I use, um, Cobra Speed, Speed something it's called. Why are you looking at me? Well, anyway, um, <laughs> but it felt really natural to play, and I said to Kevin, this, this pedal feels great. It's the same, same pedal as mine. Can you um, tell me what settings you've got? Anyway, when I got home, he sent me emails with all the settings of his pedals, with 
measurements of where the beat, of, <laughs> the angle of the beat, the angle of the foot plate, the tension on the springs. And um, he said, you know, I am a, I am a drum nerd. So, um, but it actually really inspired me. To... I was going to say, I haven't seen you that happy. About, well, that happy, but no. But talking about drums for so long, you were so excited. You were getting your ruler out and measuring your, your <coughs> measuring your bass pedal and stuff. I oh, know. Well, it was just really, really nice spending the afternoon with him because we've got chatting to him. We had um, there were some parallels really. To you know, his father was uh, was uh, a trumpet player and in, in a jazz orchestra. And um, my father was a violinist, and he used to go to sessions and and sit with drummers. He went to um, the Talk of the Town, which was a venue in in London, um, where his father worked a lot. He used to go along and sit there and sit next to drummers like Louis Belson, who's you know one of the great great uh, jazz drummers. Sat next to him at sessions. Um, I used to go to film sessions that my father were doing and, and sit next to the percussionist. So there was all that kind of stuff going on. And we know a lot of people from that era as well. So um, it was great. But he's, Gavin's, I mean, his playing just goes from strength to strength. He's, every, everything he plays on, he takes to another level. So inspiring. Yes. And a good bloke, you know, that's that's... The main thing is as I well. I know, you were very happy, bless you. And he's got a great coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> you released a book a few years ago, Do I Owe You Money? It was all quite painless, really, only because it was the, the way it was put together. Because <laughs> George, you know, being, being your best friend, <laughs> they keep coming round for free dinners and stuff. <laughs> um, and... They used to just come over, you know, George and Alan, they'd come over and George would sit me in the conservatory for an hour or two every time they were over and just chat to me and ask me questions. So it was all very relaxed. And, um, and no, I'm really pleased with the book. I think um, people seem to enjoy it. And it's just, you know, it's quite a light read. All the rest of the band have always doing solo projects and music and and you haven't done anything for years since you did post mankind with ben castle which was completely off the rails <laughs> <laughs> jazz prog whatever do do you think you'll do any music in the future as a side project or are you not really interested or found, haven't found anything that floats your boat yet um, I, I will do something in the future, I think definitely will do something, but it's just a matter of, um, you know, Marulia's been quite busy. But you've got July, August and September off this year. Yeah, and I don't really want to do much. <laughs> <laughs> are, you looking, are you looking at me for that as well? <laughs> well, I don't know what you've got planned for me. <laughs> bit gardening. <laughs> No, you don't want to do any music, okay? But you might in the future. Yeah, it's just a matter of you know if the, if someone asks me, I'll probably uh, do it. But you know the phone doesn't ring anymore. I think I'm maybe I'm retired. I don't know. Oh. No, but I definitely, as long as it's fun and as long as it's with people that that are fun and that I like and don't have egos of any sort and just want to come in and enjoy playing. You know, the opposite of brilliant, then. <laughs> opposite. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's joke. that's not fair. We I know, I was joking. Yeah, but we, it's 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 nice getting together with the boys, you know, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's take the conversation back. Of all, so. 21, it's the 21st anniversary of the Marillion Weekends this year. Jesus. That's why everything says XXI, 20 bum, mm. just in case. Um, and so when we came up with the idea all those years ago, did you believe in it? Did you think it was going to work? 
uh, what the pontins. Yeah. <laughs> did you think? Did you think we'd be where we are now, twenty one years no, later? No, I didn't think that. I mean, I, I, I didn't think Marillion would. When I joined Marillion, I couldn't have thought that it was going to last this long. So, um, the pontins thing. I don't. I had a good feeling about it, and. Of course, when we did it after after the event, it was just like it worked really well. And of course, financially, it was a success. Um, and I believe why am I asking? I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So, you do the uh, money for the band. You you pay all the invoices and look after the bank accounts. How how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I think I drew the short straw. Um, all that happened was when, um, you know, in the chaos of the late 80s, when Fish left the band, um, we had to uh, go in and see our bank manager. Uh. And the only people available to actually get into the meeting was me and Mark and John, who was managing the band at the time. And uh, we had to set up new bank accounts. And... The bank manager said, right, whose name should I put this in? And Mark said, oh, not me. Uh, and, and so it was me. So for me saying, yeah, all right, just put my name on it. From that point on, it um, got out of hand, really. And I ended up having to do all the VAT returns. and. We do, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the band get back from gigs <coughs> and can just go... Lie flat on the sofa, and we're paying invoices and doing spreadsheets and sorting life out. Yeah, in between conventions, everybody goes off and does their own thing, and and yeah, you and me just carry on every day <laughs> looking after the accounts. And we still haven't managed to siphon off enough money to go and have a really expensive holiday in the Maldives. I'm Try harder. I'm working on it. <laughs> I couldn't have survived without dipping into petty cash all these years. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. Caption. Um, so anyway, of, of, so the Merlin Weekends have been going 21 years. No, and and they're, they, I mean, they've gone from strength to strength. Yeah, well, we're really. doing them in all different countries. Do you have a favourite country yet? Or? That's well, tough, isn't it? It is. I mean, Port Zealand really is... is unique i don't know if you ever enjoy it though well it's a lot of stuff to remember you know with six or seven hours of music it's getting harder physically and mentally because you know most of the time we can't even remember each other's names then what about all that stuff so um, it is it is hard work but i mean the last conventions the, the port zealand we we kind of took a step back didn't we only a small one but by not doing swap the band and do you have a, a favorite performance of all the years you know think about all the albums you've done you know you've done marbles you've done um radiation you've done brilliant.com seasons end holidays in eden do you have a favorite moment maybe from any of the brilliant weekends i think um where we seem to take for me, and talking to Phil about it as well after the event, was um, when we did Brave at Port Zealand. It seemed to take things up another level to another level. And we thought, God, how are we going to top that? But we seem to, <laughs> which is amazing. Seem to every year. Yeah, but Brave, I thought that was really good.
time did you arrive here this morning? Uh, honest answer today, uh, five to six this morning. Nope, absolutely not. On about uh, four and a half hours sleep. Why? It's a good question. I asked myself that many a time. It's just a habit I've got into over the years because I enjoy being on the uh, front row. It gives you a little bit of immediacy when the band are playing so you can actually sort of uh, gauge um, how the band are performing. It's not just a case of if you're further back, you can appreciate Jens' light show, which is fabulous. But if you're up close, you do get that almost that one-to-one -one interplay between yourself and the band. Well, the first time I saw the band was um, actually at the Newcastle Mayfair Ballroom, which is now part of Eldon Square Shopping Centre back in 83. In terms of this degree of queuing, it was when I probably got back into seriously um, watching the band, probably about 2015. There are people, we tend to travel around the world, and, and so there, there is that hardcore group of fans who always seem to be at the front of the queue. Part of the enjoyment, certainly with traveling around the world to see follow the band, is that you get to visit places that you probably wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, and as we always say, we, it gives us a chance to catch up with old friends and also meet people who we've never met before, who become, um, I'll say, lifelong friends. You know, we, we don't know obviously how long, but. Uh, you make uh, friends who have been there for years. It's just a case of having a fairly good time. Um, and there is a lot of banter that goes on throughout the day. A lot of people obviously like to be centre stage in front of H. Um, I've always tended to defer slightly to the left because I, I like being in front of Pete. Pete is good value for money. Watch, watching how he plays, how he performs to the crowd, other people, the sort of guitar devotees, want to be in front of Rothers. But um, yeah, I mean, people have their own chosen area. Um, I mean, even if I was number one in the queue, I would still go slightly to the left. In terms of having a pit, uh, disadvantage, yeah, you can be a, you know, a little bit further from the stage, um, but the big advantage with it is we, a lot of us have got to know the, uh, the camera crews over the years, both, both your, your team. Um, and also the photographers, a lot of whom have actually become friends over the years. I jokingly call it a cult. Uh, <laughs> it's very, very strange. I, I, I follow a few bands and there's only one or two that seem to have this interplay between the band and the fans, both in the venues and outside. It is nice that you know we've got a band here who um, not only can we almost view as uh, friends, but um, yeah, they tend to recognise you away from the event. Sometimes maybe they don't want to, but they, they're entitled to their private life, which is good. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you do get to know them over the years, um, some better than others, because some quite rightly guard their own privacy a little bit more. They probably do get a little bit bored with seeing the same faces, but raise the price you pay for the fact that you've got a group of fairly fanatical individuals who are prepared to come out and queue all day. The set list thing has become a little bit of a joke. I have to name check my friend Seward Mill. The two of us have become quite well known. Uh, if you look at most of the Facebook posts, it's normally me and Seward. Some people obviously like to collect them. Um, what I tend to do, I get those photographs and then I give them away. Um, an example would be, for example, at uh, Utrecht last year. There was a young lad, he was 10 years old. It was his first gig ever, not just his first Marillion gig. And at the end of which, I was talking to his family and he was very proudly clutching one of Ian's drumsticks. So I said, oh, would you like the set list as well? And it's, I don't know whether I'm being altruistic, it's probably got a degree of satisfaction from seeing something, to me, it's just a bit of paper. I've had the photo, um, I know I've been at the gig, why not give it to someone who hasn't had that opportunity? I mean, I, I kept the first set list from Port Zealand this year because that was my 200th Marillion gig so it's 209 tonight um, but uh, other than that I very very rarely keep them if it's a major gig you know it's like uh, uh, say one of the Albert Hall gigs or uh, the Hammersmith gig yeah I might keep those but normally no I give them away um, it might make someone's evening which is quite nice
this is just a reminder to ask you to send in your welcome to Marillion monthly videos as you saw at the beginning um, we love receiving them we've had them from all over the world make them as creative as possible the details for sending them are in are in the comments below while you're filming things we'd also like to ask you to send us your favorite Marillion memories or Marillion stories we're going to feature some of them in some episodes going forward in the future and then finally um, we would like you to film yourself telling us the reason you started listening to Marillion for example the reason I started listening to Marillion was to annoy my brother and all these years later, I'm managing the band and married to the drummer. So it really did annoy my brother. But if you've got any memories or stories like that, if you look in the comments below, it, um, you know, the example bit that's written underneath the um, video. It'll, description. Description, thank you, Tim. It'll all be there and it's easy and send them to us and we'd be really grateful to see them, wouldn't we, Ian? Absolutely. Dear. Dear, yes, dear. Thank you. Over to Tony Firminger, who is the uh, person that's responsible for surprising the band, well, surprising everybody, with all these amazing things he does at gigs like uh, De Montford Hall. Well, we basically started in 2015. Um, somebody got hold of me and said, Let's do something, let's surprise the band. I said, all right, what do you want to do? And he suggested everyone wear different coloured, or different football strips. And I thought, I'm a Man United fan, I'm not walking through Wolverhampton in a Man U shirt. I'll be shivved. Um, so I had a bit of a think about it, and it was actually Vicky, my partner in crime, said, why don't we do some flags? You can get in touch with a lot of people at once at Facebook. So we set up a, a surprise the band group put the idea out and it was good we got I don't know I'd say we got about five six hundred flags on the day and when they first all went up at the right time um, we, we actually made Mr Hogarth drop his tambourine and it worked and I thought that's it I've done my bit now I can retire and it came up to 2017 and somebody said what are you doing this year Tony so I'm doing, not doing out why not I've done my bit the kind of bullied me into, into doing something. So I thought, okay, what are we doing? And we're doing dot .com. Go. Perfect. Now, this is the embarrassing bit. I'm a massive, massive fan of rom-coms. I am a big girl's blouse when it comes to rom-coms. And I just watched one called Pitch Perfect 2. At the end of that, they all get these little white torches and they're waving them. And I thought, you know what, that would work. That would work really, really well. Um, Maria Villiers said, I've seen these little things, little finger lights that you put on. So I looked them up, thought they are absolutely perfect, we will do that. And I started bullying people. Um, that's my main role. I'll come up with the idea and then I, I bully people. People bought lights and they passed them out. And we had about 2,000 lights and they all came up and it's, that's when everything exploded then. We didn't go. But the month before, my eldest daughter was born and she was born through an emergency C-section. So my place there was with my family. Much as I'd love to have been at, with the band at that time, you know, I waited for that gig for 40 years. I was gobsmacked. I was absolutely amazed. 2019, a month to go, nothing planned, brilliant. I'm going to be able to enjoy the gig. Lucy gets in touch with me, says, we've just done this thing at Port Zealand. We put some 
lights up and lit them up for uh, this train is my life. Do you fancy doing that? Oh God, I've got a month, come on. I had eight months last time. The members of the group, they were magnificent. They all rallied, they all bought their own lights and bought hundreds and hundreds of others, handed them out to people in the crowd. And they went up perfectly at the same time. It was brilliant. Again, we were up in the balcony and it was just amazing to watch. Christmas lights <laughs> They go by in the houses Of anonymous souls So take my hand Squeeze it tight And then I thought, yay, I can retire. That's it, done me bit. Done me bit three times, don't need to do it again. And then 2021 came. <laughs> to be honest, there's no other song Marillion have done that is better suited for fan participation than Care. The Angels of the World section is just superb. But coloured lights wouldn't have worked. So um, there's a guy called David Burnett. We were bandying ideas and he said phone lights. And that's just worked perfect. Everybody has a phone. Nobody needed to buy anything. All we needed to do was tell people and on that day that was just amazing. Every single phone went up at once. The angels in the swirl. There's such a connection at that point, at that time, between the band and the, and the crowd. I think it's because we feel like we're contributing in some small way, you know, hopefully making a difference. This year we have Map of the World coming up. The idea would be get three or four hundred flags, um, have them dotted around. Um, these flags would go up, they go up in a coordinated fashion again at the chorus. The band would look down and go, well that were a bit rubbish. You know, you've let us down. And then go away that, that night thinking, they've done their surprise thing, it were crap. And then on the Sunday night, we have Ukrainian flags. At my last count, I reckon I've got about a 60% coverage, which I think I can do better <laughs> in the 12 hours that I've got. It should look amazing. And if this is going out after tonight, it did look amazing. <laughs> I already have an idea for 2025. I've just got to find a song for it to fit. But it, it, it should be good. Unless the band are watching it, in which case we're doing note. <laughs> I have an, an announcement. Um, the winner of last uh, month's competition to win tickets to every gig on the next tour is uh, on the screen. Good luck. Right, the, uh, the um, winner of this month's competition will be winning a Zoom call with me. So uh, just leave a comment below. Thank you. I'm putting my glasses on because I've got a couple of comments that were left on YouTube after last month's Marillion Monthly with H. All right. Um, Michael Favreau 7617, that's his username. I'm not a number, I'm a free man. Oh, sorry. He says, I can't wait for Ian's insight and observations. Please get him to talk about his drumming on Fugazi and his playing on Highly Strung with Steve Hackett. So... Talk about your drumming on Fugazi, please, and then Highly Strung. 
For Garzi, drumming, hmm. How does that go? Drum on the sofa. <laughs> well, people were asking me last week about the drum intro to Emerald Lies. And, oh, yeah. And one bloke said, you know, can you tell me what, uh, what it is, the, the fill at the beginning? And I thought, well, I don't know what it is. I just sort of played it. But then a, another response was, it's a double paradiddle with the left hand staying on the snare drum. And it, come on. <laughs> I'm wearing myself out here. Um, left hand staying on the snare drum and the right hand goes down the tom-toms. But it's a double paradiddle. Well, I didn't know it was a double paradiddle, as I said, because I just played it. So I worked it out and it is a double paradiddle, which is... That's a double paradiddle, right? And it's in Emerald Lies is in six eight, so it's one two three four five six one two three four five six one two three four. Five, but that's six. not the drumming on Figazi, is it? On Emerald Lies, the fill is. So that's the fill, and it's a double paradiddle. So that was. <laughs> that was interesting that after all these years I found out what, what the rudiment was on something I played on in 19, what, 83? 1893. Before electricity. <laughs> and <clears throat> but um, Fugazi was, it all came together pretty quickly really, which is highly unusual for a Marillion project. Um, but I did it just as an album session and um, went in and, and to Rockfield Studios and I felt totally at home with all the material that they'd, they'd written so far on that album and I just uh, got on with everyone very well and it was just fun. It is a cracking tune for you, Garzi. For Garzi itself, mm. yeah, that was, I mean, Marillion tradition, we were in a studio that cost about a thousand pounds a day <coughs> and we still hadn't written the title track of the album. And um, I remember we went to the TV room one night and watched a film called Cat People um, and the theme music to it was David Bowie. And that's actually, that track gave us the inspiration to start writing for Garzi because after we watched that film we went in the studio and we were just jamming and that whole pulse section that stuff din, din. Boom, boom. that was I think inspired by watching cat people you think or you know <laughs> mm? you said I think you think or you know I know it was because no. just that feel set up that that feel from that cat people we didn't nick it we just got influenced by it influenced so <coughs> uh highly strong with steve hackett any memories on that i think steve was used to have a really good time with steve in the studio because he's he had a lot of at the time he had a lot of kind of brazilian influences going on he used to i used to get to the studio and there would always be brazilian marimbas and things in the studio and percussion Brazilian percussion parts or Brazilian drum parts on a loop that I could play to. So I just remember jamming along to a lot of quite exciting rhythmic ideas that Steve had. It was good fun. I haven't listened to that album for a long time, so I don't know what it's... Listen when we get home. And... Mm. Daniel Gibbs says, great insight from behind the scenes and I've never seen that H on a scaffold clip before. That was a splintering heart from Port Zealand. Do you remember when he came down from the ceiling on a scaffolding pole? Was that splintering heart? Yeah. He says, ask Ian, H has gotten up to some hair raising antics over the years. <laughs> What's it like seeing him disappear from the stage or climb the speaker stacks from behind the drums <laughs> or falling off the stage? Do you see any of that or um, he's calmed down ever such a lot because I mean I remember the first big gig that we did with him in Brazil in Rio and I think if I remember correctly it was raining and 
I looked up and Steve was climbing up the PA system. Probably, I don't know, 50 feet up in the air or, and I just thought, Marillion needs singer. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again, yeah. <laughs> How about the infamous one at Port Zealand? Did you, were you aware that he'd fallen off the stage? Yes. Well, he's just suddenly disappeared. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, that was quite disturbing because I mean, he was so lucky not to actually done die. Some, yeah, done yeah, some major, go, let's major just go damage. For die. Yeah, no, that it was just horrible. <laughs> bean bun, <laughs> bean bun four zero two nine. Usernames. I love the Seasons End Deluxe. Thank you, Bean Bum. Says, ask Ian, we're at the end of the series of Ian My Deluxe reissues. Have you had a particular favourite in terms of the content? A favourite new mix, perhaps, or perhaps one of the documentaries? And are we going to keep this series going? Oh, I think we should definitely keep the series going. That... We are. Pardon? We are. We are. Yeah, well, we are going to keep the series going. <laughs> uh, what will be the next release, Ian? Probably TSE, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah that'd, be, uh, that'd be great. Because I keep getting stuff sent through to me to, to listen to. Um, but yeah, that, that should be really good. I've enjoyed um, all of them, I think. And the big surprise, I think it's been mentioned before, was for me, was... Um, the remix of Radiation. I thought that was a massive improvement. That's not technically one of the deluxe editions. No, I know, but <laughs> it's just a thing that stands out to me that... <laughs> and also, Radiation, we did at Leicester de Montfort Hall, didn't we, for the, the, the record-breaking thing. Oh, yeah, Tim, oh, Tim. Wolf Civic. Wolf Civic. Was that Wolf Civic? Wolf yeah. Civic. Oh, I thought it was the Montford Hall. No, it was Wolf Civic and we loved it. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if we still are Guinness World Record holders. So, yeah, I'm all for it, really, seeing you know, a producer's take, some of the remix. I mean, Holidays in Eden, I think that's, that's really good. Everyone always um, puts their documentaries on first, which Tim has done a fabulous job on. Have you enjoyed reliving the memories on the documentaries? No. <laughs> it's so mean. User P9Y9P says... Says <laughs> some... <laughs> must change my name. Uh. <laughs> Says the attic seems to be short of stage clothes belonging to Ian and Rothers. I wonder why. Ask Ian, what's your approach to your stage wardrobe? <laughs> <coughs> well, we all get an allowance um, for stage wear, stage clothes, and I just give all my allowance to Steve Hogarth. That's true. I do. So I'm left with wearing whatever's available from merch. You just wear Ian Mosley for President t-shirts, which are available online now. Yeah, I must I must change my attire. What what t-shirt are you wearing today? That looks oh, different. This is very good. Your sunglasses are in the way. Oh. Now this was a gift from Did Mr. Steve Hogarth. <laughs> Did it just make him laugh? <laughs> yeah, he just said, I think that's up in the street. But, yeah, I mean, so I thought I'd wear this today. So the band have got July, August and September off and then you'll be getting back together to rehearse for the November tour. Mm. Which is, I'm either making an announcement about now or we've announced last week. I'm not sure when we're going to make the announcement. But we will be going to... Germany, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland and the UK just for a quick little 
jaunt, playing awesome. some places we haven't played for a while. Did yeah. I say France? France as well. Belgium. We haven't been to Belgium for a long time, have we? Uh, you've got Lewis joining you again. Yes. Yes, look how happy he is. Uh. <laughs> and obviously it's too early to talk about set lists and we wouldn't do that anyway. Mm. Um, but then after that, you've got Cruise to the Edge next year, but apart oh. stop it. But apart, from, but apart from that, are you going back into the studio to write a new album? Well, I hope so. Hooray! Yeah, I think we're all up for having a go, but <laughs> but it's down to H and lyrics and yes, just feel right. What? It's a two-part question. Do you love me? No. Uh, it's a two-part <laughs> question. What's your favourite thing about being in Marillion and what's your least favourite thing about being in Marillion? And be honest. Well, still, being in Marillion, being in a band, you know, being with a bunch of fellas that are sort of okay blokes, I suppose. <laughs> but, it doesn't uh, mean that. <laughs> they won't watch it anyway. They'll never know you said that. Oh, well... Yeah, being in a band, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's still its still a dream come true, being in a proper band. And um, and it's still fun. It's still fun getting together and, and talking rubbish with everybody. <laughs> they really do. Honest to God, when we're having meetings, you should... <laughs> they play yellow digression cards and they, they'll start talking about the most random stuff. It's, it, I have, you'll come back from work, work. <laughs> Why do people always laugh when I say, they say, what are you doing? I'm off to work. <laughs> <They> just, you <laughs> just... <laughs> You'll come back from your two hours at the studio and you'll say, oh, we were talking about, you know, lawn mowers today or yeah. I know, paint stripper. <laughs> Price that... of white goods. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, it's a fabulous thing being in a band really a band that's getting on well and um, and you know a band that's um i mean earning a living doing something that that you love with a, a bunch of people that you get on well with I mean, that's just a great thing it is a great thing mm. well thank you for your time what about the things the negative things about being in marillion oh <laughs> oh and, yeah and it on and off <laughs> yeah. <Leave it> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shouldn't have asked that. So, shall I, I I've I've got a question. Good. <laughs> I've got a question, but I'm probably gonna have to answer it. What, you want a divorce? <laughs> <laughs> Can you afford it? No. Right, then let's stay together. <laughs>